Welcome everyone to Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and we have come to the final installment in the Patrick Claiborne biography. I hope you all have enjoyed watching it as much as I have enjoyed covering the life of Patrick Claiborne. Next week, I will be featuring a Western Theater Union General and begin that series. Stay tuned to find out who I cover next. The Army of Tennessee met up near Jonesboro, south of Atlanta. Claiborne's men were bloodied from the constant fighting over the last few months. They rested for the first time in a long time while the Army licked its wounds. Claiborne had lost three important men in his division at the Battle of Jonesboro. One of his staff officers was severely wounded, and the other one, Calhoun Benham, resigned in despair and headed for Mexico. General Govan and much of his brigade had been captured. Hood blamed everyone but himself for the failure to defend Atlanta and asked for Hardy to be reassigned to another army. On September 15th, the governor of Georgia declared a day of prayer and fasting. On that day, one of Claiborne's brigade commanders, General Lowry, who was a Baptist preacher, preached a sermon to the division in a large stand of poplars and oaks. Claiborne wouldn't be without Govan for long. An unusually quick prisoner exchange resulted in Govan and his 600 men coming back into the division bringing the total number of troops under Patrick to 3,290. In late September, President Davis came to visit the Army. He made speeches to multiple units, but when he and Hood rode by part of Claiborne's division, they started chanting for Johnston. That night, a staff officer came into camp and informed the men not to chant that because it hurt General Hood's feelings. While the President was with the Army, Hardy again asked to be transferred or have Hood deposed as Army commander. Davis didn't want to get rid of Hood, so he transferred Hardy. Claiborne was devastated and contemplated submitting his resignation as well. He said he would rather be an officer on Hardy's staff than a divisional commander under Hood. However, loyalty to his division led him to decide against resigning. Again, a corps command position came open, and instead of assigning Claiborne to lead Hardy's corps, Benjamin Cheatham was again chosen over him. It was around this same time that Claiborne approached Hood about obtaining a two-week furlough. He wanted to return to Mobile to be married, but Hood simply shook his head and told him that the campaign season was still ongoing and that he couldn't spare any general for the upcoming campaign, let alone Claiborne. When Susan received the letter from Patrick informing her that he would not get leave to marry her, she shut herself in her room and cried all day. She confessed to a friend that the constant worry about Claiborne during the Atlanta campaign had severely weakened her health. The Army of Tennessee marched north. With rations running low, the Confederate soldiers were tempted to scavenge off the land. Claiborne, riding ahead of his division, caught a group of soldiers picking apples near the roadside. Damage in property was against General Hood's orders, so Claiborne told the men to sit the six bushels of apples along the road. When the division commander sat on a fence and began to smoke his pipe, General Granberry's brigade arrived at the location. As Granberry rode up, Claiborne addressed him, General Granberry, I am peddling apples today. Adopting his mood, Granberry replied, How are you selling them, General? Claiborne responded, These gentlemen have been very kind. They have gathered the apples for me and charged nothing. I will give them to you and your men. Now you get down and take an apple and have each one of your men pass by and take one, only one, mind, until they are gone. His entire brigade marched by in single file, each man picking up an apple as he passed. The men offered a hurrah for old Pat and smiled at the guilty party. Once the apples were gone, Claiborne ordered each of the guilty men to carry a rail for a mile before returning to their unit. Once the men got just south of Dalton, Hood ordered his men to destroy the railroad tracks. Claiborne's division did not have the tools to properly deconstruct the rail lines, so Claiborne had his men line up and down the rail, and at the signal, they would pick up the ties and rails and essentially flip them over. This made them easier to tear apart. Once the rails were tore away from the ties, the ties were stacked in piles and set ablaze. Then the rails were put over the burning ties until malleable. Then the soldiers twisted them around telegraph poles, calling them Mrs. Lincoln's hairpins. The men arrived at Dalton where a garrison of 750 Union soldiers, about two-thirds of them being new black recruits, were stationed. Claiborne's men formed into battle line in front of the fortifications as Hood asked for the garrison's surrender. The Union commander asked that his black troops be treated like white troops, but Hood said that was up to the War Department, not him. The Union commander complained that once the surrender had taken place, his black troops were tormented by Claiborne's division. Claiborne would transfer the prisoners to the engineers, who formed them into gangs to help destroy part of the railroad. 
After that, the army moved west into Alabama to Tuscumbia, where Hood ordered a pontoon bridge built across the Tennessee River. It was constructed and Claiborne's men marched across on November 13th. Rains delayed the movement of troops on the campaign that Hood had planned to retake Nashville. Claiborne, meanwhile, gave patriotic speeches to his troops, attempting to lift their spirits. As one of Claiborne's biographers put it, did such behavior suggest that he was optimistic about the forthcoming campaign, or was it a manifestation of a determined fatalism? He was by nature quietly intense, and it would have been perfectly consistent with his fatalistic view of the world that as the prospects grew darker, he would feel compelled to assert his commitment more passionately. On their way north, the division passed by the plantation home of Lucius Polk. Claiborne was thrilled to see his dear friend again. However, they couldn't visit long and Claiborne rode off with his division toward Columbia. Across the Duck River was two Federal Corps commanded by John M. Schofield. Hood planned on using part of Lee's Corps to hold them in place and then swing the rest of the army north to cut off their retreat. On the march, Hood's 12-mile march turned into a 17-mile march, but the army made it to Spring Hill. A sizable force awaited the Confederate army at that town. Claiborne would be heavily involved in the attack. Hood wanted to maintain control of the turnpike that traveled between Columbia and Spring Hill. However, in the meeting with General Cheatham, the Corps commander believed the objective to be the town, not the turnpike. Claiborne, along with General Nathan Bedford Forrest, would attack the Union defenders and outflank them but 18 guns arrayed hub to hub would send his men back. Another attack by the majority of Cheatham's corps was to be made, but John C. Brown complained that his division could be too easily outflanked and failed to attack. His attack was to signal Claiborne to launch his own attack, so the day passed away into the night with neither division launching another assault. The Army of Tennessee then bedded down without holding the turnpike. Claiborne awoke the next day to find that the enemy in his front were gone, and even worse, the Union Army to the south of them had marched along the unguarded pike and made it to Franklin, Tennessee. The demoralized Confederate Army pursued. Grumbling throughout the Army command was getting louder, as each general blamed the other for the failure. Claiborne made it to the Twin Hills flanking the turnpike just south of Franklin. There he sat down and enjoyed a game of checkers with one of his staff officers. Then the game was interrupted by Hood's orders to report to headquarters. In the parlor of the Harrison House, Hood outlined his plan for the day's attack. Claiborne reportedly stated, I will take the enemy's works or fall in the attempt. Claiborne's staff and his subordinates noticed that when their division commander came to give them their orders, he was despondent. Usually their commander was excited to go into battle, but this time was different. General Govan said to Claiborne, Well, General, there will not be many of us that get back to Arkansas. Claiborne responded by saying, Well, Govan, if we are to die, let us die like men. Claiborne then went to a small knoll where Confederate sharpshooters were positioned and where he could get a good view of the ground that awaited him. He had left his field glasses behind, so he asked Lieutenant John Ozane of the sharpshooters if he could borrow a telescope. Ozane removed the telescope from his Whitworth rifle and handed it to Claiborne. He viewed the earthworks of the enemy and then said, they are most formidable. He then rode off to organize his division. His men had to maneuver over nearly two miles and he knew that every inch of ground would be contested by artillery and musketry. Claiborne rode along the ranks of his men, some who had followed him into battle since they left Arkansas. He told them to save their fire and to use the bayonet. It was four o'clock and sunset was approaching. Claiborne looked back toward Winstead Hill for the signal from Cheatham to advance. A signal flag was dropped and Claiborne called out for his men to forward march. Nearly 20,000 men stepped off to make this attack. As they maneuvered over the terrain, Claiborne's head was on a swivel, making sure his division was in order and each was keeping pace with the other. An advanced Union line delivered a volley into Claiborne's men, then the rebels gave a rebel yell and sent the Federals running for their main line. When they broke, General Brown to Claiborne's left yelled to Patrick that they will go into the works with them. Claiborne agreed and yelled to his men to go into the enemy's works with the running Federals. This would work to the Confederate advantage. The Union troops in the main line would not fire because their comrades would be in their line of fire. Here was the opportunity to break the Union line. It now became a race. Claiborne still mounted spurred ahead into the mass of men, charging diagonally across the front of his own brigades toward the center of the Union line. In mid-canter, his brown mare went down heavily, nose first killed by rifle fire. Picking himself up, Claiborne called for another horse. 
A staff officer, Lieutenant James Brandon, rode up and dismounted quickly, offering the reins to Claiborne. Claiborne had one foot in the stirrup when this horse too fell to the ground, shot dead. Dropping the reins, Claiborne drew his sword and waving it over his head, charged forward on foot toward the Yankee line, where he could see the men of his command clambering over the earthworks. Granbury and Govan's brigade had breached the enemy line. Claiborne ran toward the breach. Fifty yards short of his goal, a single Union bullet penetrated his heart, killing him instantly. His men exploited the breach, but would be pushed back to the opposite side of the earthworks. With only the width of a trench line separating them, each side fired blindly at one another in the darkness. During the night, Schofield would move north. Claiborne was now one of thousands of bodies laying on the field at Franklin. The next morning, the morning sun revealed the grisly scene. A Mississippi soldier remembered when he found Claiborne. I and two others were the first to discover his dead body at early dawn the next morning. He was forty or fifty yards from the works. He lay flat upon his back as if asleep, his military cap partly over his eyes. He had a new gray uniform. It was unbuttoned and open. The lower part of his vest was unbuttoned and open. He wore a white linen shirt which was stained with blood on the front part of the left side or just left of the abdomen. This was the only sign of a wound I saw on him, and I believe it was the only one he had received. I have always been inclined to think that feeling the end was near, he had thus laid himself down to die, or that his body had been carried there during the night. He was in his sock feet, his boots having been stolen. His watch, sword belt, and other valuables were all gone, his body having been robbed during the night. His body was placed on a litter and carried about a mile to Carnton, the McGavick Plantation House. They laid him on the porch next to some of the other generals killed in the attack, like General Adams, Granbury, and Strahl. From there, his body was sent south to Columbia and buried in Rose Hill Cemetery. Lucius Polk attended the small funeral of his former commander. He wasn't at ease about the place in which his friend lay. He remembered that on his way to fight at Franklin, Patrick had commented about the beauty of his plantation, so he decided to disinter him and reinter him near St. John's Chapel on Polk's plantation. Susan Tarleton heard of her fiancé's death five days after the battle. She would be consumed with grief and wear black for an entire year. She would eventually get married to a former Confederate captain named Hugh Cole in 1867, but she would die less than a year later from an effusion of the brain. Claiborne's friend and comrade, Learned Mangum, was not satisfied with his friend's resting place and raised the funds to move him to Helena. Lucius Polk, Benjamin Cheatham, Isham Harris, and Jefferson Davis walked in the public procession to the docks in Memphis, where the body traveled downriver to Helena. In that city, his body was finally laid to rest in Evergreen Cemetery in April 1870, exactly 20 years after he had arrived in that small frontier town.